Um, in my situation, there were a lot of bugs that bit me. I, I, I think to date, I still have the most bug bites on my body. It was about 2,000 at any given time. Can you even imagine what it's like to live in a jungle without any clothes, any food, any water, having to sleep on the earth and then having to fend for yourself whilst your skin is being attacked by insects and bitten all over. How do you even overcome such a ordeal mentally, physically? Listen to Tara and hear how she did it. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Tara. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. So fantastic to have you on the show. And I'm so excited to share with everybody your story and all the amazing things that you have done so far in your young life. Um, so my first question that I ask all my guests is for you to share a little bit about your personal life, where you were born, a bit about your education, your journey there, where you now live, and you can share about your family, but you don't have to, any hobbies and interests. Well, of course, I know your hobbies and interests. <laughs> it's what you do. Um, so over to you, Tara. Yes, I was born in Michigan here in the United States. But I grew up in central Illinois, a very conservative rural community in a town called Morton. And I grew up in the generation of stay outside until the streetlights come on. And so I had a lot of freedom to play in the creeks and the forests and cornfields. Um, mm. I grew up right across from a cornfield, so corn country. And it was just a really beautiful way to grow up. Um, I'm the oldest of five. And so I had a lot of um, additional responsibility um, being the oldest in a family. So we were kind of a big, a big, fun family, actually. And growing up in a conservative community really kind of actually paved the pathway for me to be curious about what was going on outside of um, a conservative culture. Mm. And... When I went to college, uh, I went to Northwest Missouri State University, uh, north of Kansas City, and I earned an earth science degree uh, with an emphasis in geology. So growing up outside and then being able to learn about the outdoor sciences uh, was very interesting to me. And I also grew up with ADD. So I have this touch of like restlessness in my system. Right. Um, yes. And so being outside was really important to me and healing and adventurous. And I could create my own adventures and journeys. So just the outside and nature in general um, has always been in my life. Mm. And when I graduated from college, uh, I landed my first job in wilderness therapy in Florida, actually. So I moved all the way down to Florida and worked outside with troubled youth, adjudicated youth um, in the Florida wilderness. And working with kids, um, again, kind of being the oldest of five, um, so kind of having that background of, of a nurturing a soul, Yes, um, I was able to see um, teenagers change and with their connection, living in nature. We lived a very primitive lifestyle. So we would cook outside, hike outside. We would build our own structures to sleep in. And that deeper connection to nature living outside um, was another important factor in my life. Mm. Yes. Um, so did Everything. that was sorry sorry to interject there, Tara. Was the that was it 
the nature and being outside that helped your um, ADD and um, did that help the other kids as well? So could you empathize with what they were going through uh, because of what you'd gone through perhaps? And was that, were you able to see in them perhaps parts of you and therefore knowing that being outside helped you, it would help them as well? Spending time outside in nature, immersed in nature, living in nature can heal anybody, whether you have ADD or you have severe trauma. Um, it resets our system mm -hmm. and witnessing, and I'm just going to say youth, but also adults later on in my um, career, witnessing people be able to calm their systems touch the ground, being in connection with Mother Earth will reset our soul, will reset our body, will reset our mind. We're so distracted today by all the technology that we have mm. and, and the stress, right, of everyday life and pressure from parents, from family, from our boss, whatever the situation is. Um, it brings us back to our roots. It brings us back to our ancestral connection. And seeing that, witnessing that, feeling that beautiful connection that we can make with Mother Earth really resets us and reestablishes our, our roots. Mm. And industrial connection. So, okay. So, so when you did the, did you call it wilderness therapy? It's a brand new title for me. I've never heard of it. <laughs> wilderness therapy um, is another term for counseling in nature. Right. Um, and there's a wide variety of wilderness therapy. There's some immersion programs like the ones that I work for where you live outside. Um, and then there's another version of adventure type wilderness therapy where maybe you're outside for a half of a day, a few hours at a time, um, or for a short period of time. The programs that I've worked with in the past um, range from 90 to 100 days where the, the youth would come into the program and live um, in a primitive setting or wilderness setting for that amount of time. For 100 and, days? Mm -hmm, wow. Wow. Days, yeah, depending on um, what their particular program was. Yeah. Um, if they were private, it could be for 90 days. Their parents, quote unquote, made that decision. Um, but if they were court ordered, maybe they would have to stay for two cycles um, or a cycle and a half. Sure. So being outside for that amount of time really does change you. I bet. And obviously, you as the therapist working with these youngsters and adults um you would have to be with them all the time correct correct um, most wilderness therapy programs that are immersed um, staff has a week on a week off um, so we're able to refresh and come back right right um, but they used to stay there um and what's in, that in. go ahead sorry tara but the youth stay there the entire time. Um, they're not able to leave and come back unless if there's a, a medical issue or something. Mm. Um, they're there the entire time. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and was this your like your first job after all your education and graduation, or did you do some other things before that? Wilderness therapy was my first real job, I'll say. Wow. <laughs> um, I, yes. Yeah. I graduated mid-year with a teaching degree in earth science. And so it was difficult to find a job um, in the educational system mid-year. So I did some fillers until um, I came across wilderness therapy and wanted to give that a try. And it really resonated with me. Um, and yeah, my first job was in Florida and 
Um, I went back to wilderness therapy several years later. Um, after working in Florida as a wilderness therapist, I moved to Colorado and became an outdoor guide. And I did that for about a year. And I had various other jobs um, with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I, I did teach for a little while in Colorado Springs, Colorado, um, at a middle school there. And then I went back into wilderness therapy. And the second wilderness therapy program was a bit different than the first in Florida because we didn't have structures that we lived in. It was a complete immersion. It was a complete immersion into the wild, and so we started our fires with sticks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we hiked almost every day. We didn't have an outhouse or a toilet to use, mm. and we cooked over a campfire um, every night. And we lived outside in extreme temperatures. So the program was located on the western slope of Colorado. Um, so lower in elevation in the mountains, kind of in a desert area, Yes, kind of a high altitude desert area. And so in the winter, it would get down to zero degrees, sometimes negative temperatures. Yeah. And it was very primitive survival living. And so we had a backpack. We didn't have tents. <gasps> and we would wow. Yeah. <laughs> We would wrap ourselves in a tarp with a, a winterized sleeping bag and sleep on the snow. Whoa. Well, you didn't yeah. even make a... Because what they sometimes say is you've got to make a snow hole to be able to get keep the heat in so you don't lose any body heat. That, that must be quite scary because you could have frozen, right? <laughs> Well, we did have the trust of the sleeping bag, negative 40 degree sleeping bag, and it the temperatures never dipped down that low. Right. Um, but yes, we could cover ourselves with snow um, over the, the tarps. It was called a wiggy, <laughs> it was like a big burrito that we slept in. Um, but yeah, winterized um, survival is a lot different than in, than in the summer, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> you wake I'm, up and everything's frozen and you're sticking your water bottles and your sleeping bag with you so you can wake up with water and your water isn't frozen. It's so fascinating to hear you share this because I'm obviously in the UK, you're in the USA and we've just where I am, we've had a little bit of snowfall um, a week ago. But for the whole week, whilst the snow's been melting and it's all gone now, but for the whole week, and we all live inside houses. It's been a real trial for this country. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've just not been able to cope, and we're inside houses that are heated. You know, um, right. it is so fascinating how we take so much for granted in terms of not, you know, all the heat that we have and the buildings that we live in. I couldn't imagine. I mean, the temperatures now are going overnight. They're going down to zero or two degrees or three degrees Celsius. This is and and yeah, it's really cold when I'm walking the dog. It's very cold. You know, I couldn't imagine having to to sleep in it. It's it's that's quite scary for sure. Wow. Yeah, okay. there are a lot of there are a lot of variables mm. for sure. Okay, so. So you went to Colorado, you've been doing, you were doing the therapy in Colorado as well, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, I was doing wilderness therapy and working outdoors until about 2008. Right. And in 2008, I became a mother. My daughter was adopted from China. And that was really exciting. She yeah. was 10 and a half. Wow. Yes. And so at that time, I, I decided to shift my energy into the social services field. Mm. And I worked for a boys and girls club for a few years. And then I shifted into county social services and their prevention family department. So I was in an office. So here, my background was working outside, being immersed in nature to an office setting and with ADD that's not the best match oh, I bet. <laughs> um, 
And really my, uh, my attention span for work, um, ranges from about two to three years. So I'm kind of in that generation of, all right, I'm bored. I've accomplished what I needed to do with this position Mm. and I'm going to find something else. Um, and that's what I did. And at that time, it was really important for me to be able to provide for my family. And, um, I was also married, um, and have insurance and all those benefits that go along with um, kind of a government county job. And so I did that for a few years. And it got to the point where I realized I was losing myself um, working in an office setting. And I was kind of like the mad scientist behind the computer, writing grants, um, doing reports, data, and the people that um, that worked under me, I was a manager, went out and got to meet with the families and do this and that. Um, and I was starting to lose my sense of self um, because I really need nature in my life to stay centered and grounded. Mm. And I started to shift into somebody that I felt in my own mind was becoming ugly. And I was starting to recognize that. Um, and my daughter wanted to be homeschooled. And so I looked for work again and I found a job working out of the home um, remotely, still with social services um, for the adoption exchange. So in the adoption field, and I supported families in post adoption. So post adoption services. Yes. And I shifted from a full time to about a three quarters time job. So I had time to go outside and connect with nature in my own way and then support my daughter in being homeschooled. And spending time in nature again, I realized that I needed something to shift my life back to where it needed to be. Mm. And as I was raising my daughter, um, I lived remotely. I've, I've lived re- remotely quite a bit since I moved to Colorado in 2000. And my family lived on three acres. We were semi off grid. We had chickens, um, heated our homes with wood. And we always lived close to national forests. So I had access to trails and um, exploration and everything. And I started to search online, like, how do I change my life? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I need another adventure. I I was seeking something, but I didn't know what it was. And something popped up on a website that I was on uh, asking for people to apply for this survival television show. And it was a pilot program. And I applied for the show and the casting company called me back and I went through an interview series. And then the production casting portion of the production um, stopped and they decided not to produce the the show. Right. But about a month later, I got a call from the casting company and they said, you know, we have this other show that we think you would be really good at. And it's called Naked and Afraid. And I had never heard of the television show. I'm really not a television person. No. And I said, well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and and the, uh, the woman, the, the casting woman said, well, check it out and give me a call back if, if you think you would like to apply for it. And so I checked it out. And I learned that the whole premise of the show um, no clothes, no food, no water, survive for three weeks. And let's see what happens. Um, And with my wilderness survival background, I really felt like I had the skills to succeed in this challenge. I bet. Yes. Yeah. And for me, it wasn't about being on TV. It was about testing my skills, testing, um, how I can survive. Can I really do this Mm. kind of that self empowerment piece? And so I applied for the show 
And I started to practice my old skills that I had set off for this um, to the side for many years. Mm. And they came back pretty quickly. <laughs> and um, they flew me out to LA. I had a last interview. And when my plane landed back in Denver the same day, I had an offer. And I had to turn it down. <laughs> because Whoa. I <laughs> I know it was, I was really upset. Um, they, the, the uh, message on my phone was, can you um, film in a week and a half? And I did have an agreement with my employer at the time that I would give a certain time notice. Yes. Take off the uh, three and a half weeks of work. And I thought they wouldn't call me back, but they did. They of course called me back and um they offered me a spot um, at a filming location in Panama on a remote island called Isla San Jose, a very beautiful island, um, the, the Pearl Islands on the Pacific side of Panama. Mm. And I immersed myself back into nature again, but on a whole new level. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> You are, you're stripped of your clothes and you have no food <sighs> and <laughs> you are forced to really survive. This is true survival. And what you see on TV, um, people think that they give you food in the background and um, give you extra support. There is a level of support when it comes to medical intervention. Yes. But besides that, the camera crew just follows you around and captures your story 24 seven with many different cameras on different angles. And then they edit it, of course, to yes. the story that I think that the viewers will like. Um, so my experience was, I don't really know if it's typical, um, but there are other survivalists that have experienced something similar to me. Yes. And while I was out there, I went in with this like this badass attitude, right? I'm gonna like conquer this. I'm yeah. gonna like, immerse this strong, powerful woman, which I did, but at the same time I was completely humbled mm. because I I realized during that experience that there's other things in life that are more important. And sleeping on the ground naked. I chose to sleep on the ground. The first couple of nights I slept on a raised bed, but um, in my situation, there were a lot of bugs that bit me. I, I, I think to date, I still have the most bug bites on my body. There was about 2000 at any given time. Is that, a, I, is that a world record? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know world record, but I think a record for the show. And actually, my body was, I was kind of the, the poster cast member for that season because I had so many bites on my body everywhere. Um, I have seen it. I, I have seen the, the footage <laughs> of it. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the, the, whilst we're just talking about the bites, just... <laughs> were they did they itch or so, yes um they were more of a burning sensation for me wow. so the bugs that had bit me were the the chitras they're in the sand flea family but yes. i wasn't on a beach i was in the jungle mm. and um they're slightly different than the sand fleas but again in the same family and when the sun would come up in the morning, it was literally they would come out of the ground. They would be everywhere, even above the water, um, until the sun went down Wow! in the evening. And so they were constantly around. Um, and everybody has a different reaction. And they're attracted to different people at different levels. Right. And typically, not all the time, but typically women um, with our chemicals, whatever the case is, um, will be bit more often than, um, than a man. Mm. And so, so my partner wasn't bit as much as me for whatever reason, they were attracted to me more. <laughs> <sighs> and my reaction, um, because I, I really haven't been around that type of bug. I didn't grow up with sand fleas with, with the chitras. 
was a severe burning sensation. And I just wanted to tear my skin off. And my body went into this mode of like survival and like we have to fight this poison that's being injected into your body constantly. And even though I smeared my body with mud and ash, um, they're so tiny. They were able to get through the little cracks after the mud started to dry um, and still bite me. And I got bitten everywhere except for on my face and between my legs, everywhere else. Um, tops of my feet, hands everywhere. Um, Well, except for the palms of my hands and the bottoms of my feet. They they bit me. And um, I've never experienced anything like that in my entire life, that severe burning sensation. Um, The ash from the fire and standing in the smoke and putting on termite nests onto the fire and that particular smoke would be a a temporary relief. Yes. And I remember standing in the smoke and I would go over this motion of running my hands constantly over my body mm. for like an hour at a time, um, like a self, self-soothing self yeah. and then that movement to keep the bugs off um, at the height of the day where they were most active. Yeah. Um, so you learn to adapt to that way. And it's really interesting because after our, a while after I was bitten so much, my body actually started to build up a tolerance and, and I just like instinctively like knew what to do, even if it was for hours, um, Mm. calm my system down. And they didn't intervene medically for that. This, this wasn't Um, considered too bad. (laughs) (laughs) Um, at first, the very first reaction that I had, they did intervene and they gave me like a Benadryl. Um, but that was just a very temporary relief. And then, um, every cast member, they do take your vitals, um, every day to every so many days, depending on how you're doing. Yeah. So they do check in with you. Um, but I do know that the, uh, the medic on hand and the production crew were pretty concerned about me because, they thought maybe I would go into like a shock yes. um, or th- the very first time I experienced that pain, I had a hard time calming down mm. uh, and my breath and my, um, my vitals were very uh, um, elevated. Yeah. So um, they just kind of coached me and said, you're going to have to calm yourself down. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I did, I was, I was able to. So that, um, I mean that, you know, in terms of, I mean, you know, lots of people have to go through lots of things in life. and But going through something like that for you in, you know, despite the fact that you had all that training that you've had throughout your life and being in the wilderness, you you never experienced an attack to your body in that way before. So how did you, I think, there's the physical side, but then there's the mental and emotional side. So how did you overcome the kind of emotional, the mental side of that attack <laughs> on your body? Mm-hmm. I really used and embodied the connection that I had with Mother Earth. Um, being able to sleep on her every night and having that relief of, of the bugs as well, um, sleeping by the fire. And I swear that one night while I was out there, I was able to feel the pulse of the earth underneath me. And it was just a very beautiful moment. Wow. And I really felt like she nurtured me. She provides us with all of our resources, right? Water, food even shelter. Yeah. We just have to be able to find those things and trust ourselves um, and putting together those resources to survive. And I also had to trust my instincts. So while you're out there, at least in, in my situation, after a few days, your mental, um, the way that you think changes at least for me, it did. I really embodied what I was experiencing. And 
your mind kind of flips into this primitive way of thinking. And I really um, felt like I was able to like connect with my ancestral um, heritage and okay, what are my priorities right now today? I need water. I need food, X, Y, and Z. Yes. And you start to think differently. Um, at night, you're, more aware of your surroundings because it's dark all around you and um there are predators that are out there and so even sleeping you sleep different um in my situation we didn't have a lot of food resources and so i lost a lot of body weight and sleeping at night um it's hard to sleep anyway um but when you have a lack of food and then you lose weight and you're you become kind of bony. <laughs> it's sure. very difficult to find um, comfort on the ground. And so um, it was actually more comfortable for me to sleep on the ground than on an elevated bed because our, the foliage that we have, foliage that we had um, was not optimal. <laughs> and so <laughs> um, the leaves would wilt after a day and it just wasn't worth it. And so, um, so I chose to sleep. So I chose to sleep on the ground next to the fire and you know, your hips are digging into the ground and you're aware of the surroundings around you and you hear noises. Um, and normally I'm a very heavy sleeper, but you hear like one little twig break or a, a leaf move out into the darkness and you, you kind of wake up and you're like, what's that? Mm. Um, and the way that, that your mind shifts is just so so different. You are hyper aware of everything around you and even walking on the ground, right? So you're barefoot, the way that your feet touch the ground, you're much more in the moment, in the present moment. Yeah. You're much more faced with what's right in front of you at that time versus making story about the future or the past. And I really felt like I was able to drop into my body more, um, not only because of the bug bites, but your skin is exposed to the elements around you. And so the slightest breeze you notice, yeah. the sun on your skin you notice. Yeah, it changed my life forever. Um, I was tested not only with my physical survival skills, but my mind, and it reset my soul to my true self. And your body detoxes. So all of the um, toxins that we build up in our body, drinking coffee, eating sugar, whatever the case is, whatever our diet is, um, leaves your body because you're only eating true natural foods that are right there in front of you produced by Mother Earth. And that's kind of like another um, rebirth. It's a body rebirth. Wow, that, that's just incredible. And I guess it's almost impossible to describe what you went through and how you made that connection with Mother Earth, you know, literally living like that. And I think most people can only just imagine. And so my question for you, because you talked about wilderness therapy, then you talked about, you know, going to the extremes of living in the jungle like you did. My God. And, and, and you know, 99.9% .9 of the population, apart from those who are doing it for real in jungles around the world, but the Western educated, schooled, you know, living in the technology that we all do, no one's going to sign up for that. But is there something that, we can do to get us nearer, to get us on the journey to getting closer to what you describe, to be able to even get a glimpse of it, even feel some of it. What would you suggest? Yes, it's so important to incorporate nature into our lives. There's a practice called grounding or earthing. And that's being in contact with nature. It can look, it, 
it can look hundreds of different ways. Um, but some of the practices that I like to guide other people through is barefooting. Um, barefooting really helps us drop into the sensations, into the present moment of where we place our feet, feeling the earth underneath us. And our feet become um, soft, I guess I'll say, and protected with socks and shoes. And we create this distance between us in contact with, with the earth's surface. And so removing our socks, removing our shoes, placing our feet on the ground, feeling the vibration of the earth, the earth vibrates, and that vibration calms our system down. And sometimes it, we're, we're kind of scared, right? Well, I might stop on something or, or hurt my foot because there might be a rock, right? And we stop on something and it's like this fear or reaction that we have. Oh, no, I don't want to do that again. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I can but remember, I... sorry to interject there, I can remember, you know, if you go on a beach holiday, people love walking bare feet on the beach, right? And walking into the sea and and that experience is what we enjoy and probably because we can go bare feet. But if you have to walk, you know, across a rocky surface to get to the beach and you get that anticipation or fear <laughs> of having to cut your feet perhaps in some way, that's a whole different, you know, you're going to make sure you're going to wear something on your feet until you get to the soft sand and then you'll take your shoes off. Yeah. And we're so protective. We're so fearful mm. of what can happen to our feet, but we're made to be barefoot. Yeah. Our bodies are made, even structurally, um, people who barefoot have a better spinal alignment. They're happier people in general. Mm. Um, there's research out there that shows this. And as kids, we love to be barefoot, right? Yes. A lot of a lot of kids we hate putting on shoes. And what do our parents do? Oh no, you're going to get hurt. Let's let's put on shoes. Yeah. But we're born to be barefoot. Yes. <laughs> and and barefooting is just something very simple to do. Uh, the other practice is which I like to call communing with with Mother Earth. Um naturism taking your clothes off being naked in nature and feeling the elements around you um, is a really beautiful way to do that there's many opportunities um and maybe hot springs or certain pools or resorts where you can shed your clothes and everybody else is the same and that's okay beaches um, here in the United States, we might be a little more conservative <laughs> with that. Um, Same in this country. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but you can always find a place. And, and if you can't, um, I like to say, you know, lift up your shirt, put your belly to Mother Earth, breathe in your belly. Breathwork is a very beautiful um, spiritual practice in getting your energy moving in your body. And breathwork also releases dopamine and our natural oxytocin out of our brains. And it's, it releases our happy drug, right? That's already in us. So why not stimulate that? That is absolutely new to me. I didn't realize because I, I, I often describe dopamine as what people get when they're looking at Facebook. <laughs> and, you know, they want, oh, I want the next like or the next comment. Did anybody like my post? Oh, look, I've got so many likes. People commented and they get those hits of dopamine and Facebook just gives us more and more and more and more. But to, to hear you say that breath work gives you the natural dopamine. Wow, that's... I, no one's ever said that to me before. And I've, I've done yoga and I've done breath work and no one's explained that before. So thank you for that. That's amazing. You're welcome. That's that science piece behind um, breath work. 
Mm. And it's all natural. It's already in our bodies. We're just bringing that out of us. And so why not combine that with our connection with Mother Earth and, and grounding? And our, if, if you're familiar with the root chakra system in our body, we have a... Um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. If you're familiar with the chakra system in our body, we have a root um, chakra and our root chakra is the first chakra and it's associated with the element earth, mother earth. Yeah. And that chakra um, holds the energy of survival, of stability, of safety, nurturing, um, even money in today's age because money is often tied with our survival. Yes. And dropping into that space and connecting with our regrounding, re recentering ourselves um, is the foundation for the rest of our our energy and chakra systems. So connecting with Earth, the element Earth, really resets that space, that energy in our body. Wow. Okay, so we there's some practical things that can people can do. Um, certainly, I think, and it does depend because it, here here comes the excuses. It depends what the weather's doing, whether I'm going to go barefoot or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> if there's snow on the ground, <laughs> I'm unlikely to be doing it. Although it might be a really amazing experience to be walking on snow bare feet. Um, <laughs> So, um, but certainly, you know, it's, it's the, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because most people you speak to, they love, everybody loves nature. Everybody loves the forest. Everybody, most people love going for a walk in, in the fresh air and they know it does them good, but, and yet we are stuck inside our houses and we are feeling, you know, we're affected because of seasonal affective disorder, SAD, SAD, because of the sunshine that we don't get in the winter, for example. But we could go out and walk in the, in the winter sun and absorb that. So there is so much I think we can do that we don't do. So why don't we do more of it, Tara? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we have to make time for it, even if it's just a few minutes a day. Um, taking a walk out in nature. Um, if you can't be in contact with the Earth's surface because there's two feet of snow on the ground, find a tree, lean up against the tree and feel that connection and visualize your energy connecting with the trunk of that tree going down into the root, into the ground. Imagine that energy coming back up into you. And there's also practices, um, other visualization practices of dropping into your root chakra, which is actually um, in Tantra. So I teach Tantra. Um, that's modality of spiritual practices. Um, our root chakra is located a little bit differently than maybe what a lot of yoga teachers practice. And what a lot of yoga teachers teach um, between the sit bones. In Tantra, the root chakra is located in the very opening of the penis or the opening of the vagina, um, the opening of the lingam. Lingam is Sanskrit for penis and yoni is Sanskrit for vagina. So coming in contact with those two places our root, the beginning of life, um, the communing of the lingam and the yoni together represents that beginning of life. So here is where the root is housed and connecting with that space, imagining even your own root extending from that sacred space and going into the earth, moving through the soil, around rocks, maybe wrapping around the root of a tree and holding us there in strength and stability. 
breathing into that space and just being. And then when you feel like you're finished with whatever meditation practice, breath practice that you're doing in that moment, retracting your root back into your body, breathing through that and going back on with your day. Very simple visualization. Yeah. And meditative. Thank you. You're welcome. And if we're inside, let's, let's bring in mother earth into our homes with rocks and crystals bring in um, dirt and sand and sink your feet into the dirt and sand and maybe a pot or a bucket or or a container and sit at your desk with the dirt (laughs) underneath your desk and and barefoot. Mm. Um, Another, another way to bring mother earth inside. So the, you are practicing this now so this is your job in teaching other people how to live more meaningful life with mother earth and that where off did that happen after you went on the um on the discovery the naked and afraid show or how did that come about well i think i was predestined to teach energy work with earth my name tara means earth wow um, and hills. <laughs> yes um so my name uh, here we are earth right here um and then when i went to college i graduated with an earth science teaching degree i know mm-hmm. mad uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so i definitely grew into my name and After Naked and Afraid, um, I came home and I had a very profound spiritual awakening. My my mind, my soul, my body was completely reset and that paved the way to feeling this complete bliss. I cried almost every day for about two weeks, not because I was sad, but because I was so happy. Mm. I felt like I knew my place in the universe. Um, and I came back and I had to make a lot of, um, decisions in my life. I completely changed my life around. I I ended up quitting my job. Um, I, I divorced my husband at the time and I shifted a lot of things in my life, um, to follow this, this new pathway that I knew I had to take. And during this time, I didn't quite know what it was. Um, but a friend introduced me to Tantra and he introduced me to Tantra actually to quote unquote, save my marriage. And I knew that was not going to save my marriage, but I loved the practice and I immersed myself with really beautiful teachers, um, Tantric teachers. And I decided after taking a few retreats and workshops that this was going to be my pathway and I was called to teach Tantra and share it with others. And I'm a little bit different than other Tantra teachers. Typically when we think of Tantra, we think of sexuality, um, which is a piece of Tantra, but it's not the whole Tantric practice. And my gift is to teach that more traditional Tantra and connecting with nature and bringing the chakra practice and energy practice with Mother Earth to others to first connect with self and then use that centered, grounded energy to connect with other people if we choose, whether that's sexuality, sensuality, nurturing, or exploration, or honoring. You can practice Tantra um, with a friend, with a daughter, a mother, a family member, a coworker, a stranger. It doesn't have to be a sexual partner. So that's where I feel I'm called in making that um, that connection with self through earth. And the word tantra itself um, means weaving of, of energies for expansion. So there's hundreds of pra- hundreds of modalities of tantra. And so picking and choosing those practices 
to expand to our higher self is basically what Tantra means. And my business name, you're welcome. And my business name is Naked Earth Tantra. Makes a lot of sense. (laughs) (laughs) And and not necessarily naked as in clothing off, but naked as in vulnerability being raw in our connection with Earth itself. And, you know, there are so many, whether you call them masks or things that we cover ourselves with um, to try and protect who we are or to mask or hide who we are. And the fact, you know, by, in a way, clearing that or, you know, undressing that or people may call it the peeling of the onion, you know, getting rid of all of that and and allow people to become who they truly are. And, you know, you can see so much of it happens around you and in the world and we see it every, regrettably, every single day in the media. And you can see people behaving in ways that are so unauthentic, not congruent with who they are with who they wish they were, eventually we all, you know, we either find it in this lifetime or or we'll be the next one, but (laughs) uh, it would be better off if we could find some of it whilst we're here right now. Yes, exactly. And one of my Tantra teachers, um, Eugene Hubland with Tribal Tantra, always uses the, the phrase shedding skin. I think that's really beautiful. Mm, Totally agree. I mean, this, you know, for our listeners, this is an unusual interview, Tara, because the target audience, and I, I still think it's really, really appropriate. Our target audience are people that are stuck in jobs where they are unhappy, unfulfilled, miserable, and depressed. And some of them have always wish to do something on their own, but haven't got the courage or the knowledge or the whereabouts how to get started. Now, your story is not a typical entrepreneurial story of somebody who leaves their job and goes and builds a business. However, I think your story is so important for people to take on board even before they decide what it is that they truly wish to do. So if they can go through the shedding of the skin to go through your Naked Earth Tantra philosophy and practice, and even if it is just spending more time in Mother Nature, spending more time with the Earth, doing the root chakra visualization, they may actually learn and find out what it is that they are meant to do in this life, rather than being unhappy and unfulfilled, stuck in a job. Very true. And making that step to start a new job, change your life, even if it's a little bit, we hold a lot of fear in that. And fear is the emotion that is connected with our root chakra. It's a very primal emotion Mm. um, that's embedded in all of us. And so staying grounded, staying centered, we will make more sound decisions and be able to trust our instinct and leading that pathway to a new job, a new sort of life, a new pathway, whatever that looks like. Making that change, trusting that it's going to be okay. And because nowadays we want so much evidence and we want answers up front before we take any step forward and we want all the guarantees up front to have all the answers and the and you know what i mean gosh you you literally push yourself to the end where you had no idea what was coming next you know whether mm-hmm. it was those bites that were coming next whether it was some where was the food coming from next you know 
you could have, and I know there are people protecting you medically, but even so, something could have happened and you could have died out there in some way. And so that's our biggest fear at the end of the day, because when, when people talk about their fears and you go, well, what's the worst that could happen? So why, why do you hold on to that fear? What's the worst that can happen? And they go, well, this could happen. I said, okay. And if that didn't happen, what's the worst that could happen next? And the thing is, we have a whole list in our brain of all those fears. And, and yeah, maybe your route of connecting with Mother Earth that actually she is going to provide and look after you is maybe a great way for people to somehow have a sense of calmness about it and, and reduce the amount of fear that they're holding inside of themselves. Exactly. And I'm going to refer to that thought process as the monkey mind. We make up stories of things that haven't even happened yet. And so leaving that monkey mind and dropping into our bodies, and that's one thing that Tantra teaches, is the practice of listening to what our body and what, what is he or she telling us dropping into those sensations, the present moment, connecting with our breath and trusting our instincts. We all have survival in us. That's still embedded in our DNA. And maybe we may not know how to start a fire with sticks, um, but we all have the ability, once we're able to connect with our truth, we have the ability to trust ourselves and to adapt to make things work. And obviously you're running your business as Naked Earth Tantra. And, and how is that going for you? And, you know, what have been some of the challenges for you? And also what have been some of the highlights in running your own business? Yes. I face a lot of challenges in, in, the, in the business world of spiritual practices, energy work, and, and Tantra. Um, one of my biggest challenges is the, the stigma that goes just with the word Tantra and what's offered through Tantra. I don't offer any hands-on Tantra massage or healing. Um, and so people that are attracted to me sometimes are searching that. And that's one of the guided practices that I don't offer. And so I'm learning how to um, project my, my truth in offering. And, oh, I don't, I don't like to use the word weeding out, but... Mm -hmm. which clients am I attracting and how can I shift my energy to attract the, the clients who are more earth-based, want to connect with self on a deeper level versus the sexual practices. <clears throat> and it's, it's a mind shift for people out there, isn't it? It's, you know, many years ago, people didn't understand yoga. Now more people think they understand yoga and they do it for um, exercise because they don't truly understand still that yoga is only a very small percentage of exercise and more of connecting with yourself uh, and being in the moment. And I suppose Tantra, you're absolutely right. It has a connotation of being the wrong kind of thing that people think of. And it's, I, I would describe it because obviously I've done some research on it. I am no expert by any means, but I did notice and see that there were so many different modalities. And I did something called many years ago, I don't practice it now, but it's something called kinesiology, which is muscle testing for health. And it was called classical kinesiology, but there are many different branches. There's health kinesiology, 
kinesiology, there's brain kinesiology, there is, you know, uh, sport kinesiology. There are many, many strands. And the same with yoga, actually, too. There are many different yeah. strands of yoga as well, as there are so many different religions in the world. So I, c I can well imagine that people misconstrue this, they misunderstand, they think the worst. And um, yeah, so how, so apart from setting the intention to attract the right clients, is that starting to happen for you? Yes, I really feel that the energy is starting to shift with my business and people that are attracted to me are understanding that connection and are seeking that regrounding, recentering, reconnection with themselves. And clients that have worked with me in the past and in the present really feel I offer this feminine and nurturing energy to help them grow, whether it's to reground or maybe to explore um, their feminine or masculine energy within themselves. So feminine and masculine energy is also another practice of Tantra. And bringing people outside in itself is just a powerful experience. Mm. And one of my, I believe one of my most beautiful offering, I believe one of my most beautiful offerings is a retreat called just simply Earth Tantra. It's bringing meditation, grounding chakra work outside um, we start off the retreat in a near 24-hour silent meditation after we learn basic tantric breath and grounding techniques. And everybody goes off and they, they commune with Mother Earth and whatever feels right for them in the moment, there's no right or wrong way. Um, you start to learn to feel your energy centers and what your body is telling you without the distraction of other people, noises technology, interaction. You're just with yourself. Mm -hmm. And people who, who fear going into silent meditation, when they're finished, they actually don't want it to end. <laughs> like, I, wish, I, I wish it was longer. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's enough time. Mm. But just experiencing a taste of that and then being able to bring that back into your own home practice for free, right? It, it costs nothing to sit on the ground. Um, it's just a, a really beautiful practice to learn. And when that space is held and, and the guiding for you, um, you leave more confident and, and knowing what to do and recentering yourself. And it's something that you can do for the rest of your life. Yeah. We, there are so many things that are completely free that are the best things for you. And unfortunately, we think we have to pay for everything. <laughs> but <laughs> we, we may need to, to learn the skill in the first place because these are skills we have got, but we've forgotten that we can use them. So we have to pay to be reminded how to do it, but then we have it for the rest of our lives. And we forget that we can have that at any time, literally, to center ourselves and connect. Wow. Exactly. Uh, okay, so... So thank you for, for sharing the challenges. And what about, what about the highlights? What are some of the great things that have happened for you in your business? Some of the beautiful highlights are just being able to simply witness somebody recentering, regrounding, tapping into their instincts and trusting that, finding their I'll call balance of masculine and feminine energies, seeing smiles on people's face, improving their well-being, and learning a new practice to have for the rest of their life. And there's so many realizations that come about um, in self-healing. And I, I'm using self-healing um, as in a term of working through our shame and trauma um, that we hold in our bodies that might make us real tight or closed off 
um, and seeing people soften and open not only physically their bodies, but their soul and their spirit and become, I'm going to use the term radiant because after working with people, there's this beautiful radiance that comes about on their face and their body and just a very open and soft um, yet powerful energy that they hold and radiate. Brilliant. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Every- <laughs> yeah. I think everybody would like a bit of that, for sure. Everybody needs it. <laughs> <laughs> so how how are you getting your message out to the the rest of the United States, the rest of the world? Do you have a do you have a plan or do you see what comes up and you know just evolve as as things develop? I do all of the above, Michael. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I plan. Um, I like to go with the flow. That's a very feminine energy when things pop up. Yeah. Um, if it feels right at the time, I will shift things around um, to make it happen and provide where a call is needed. Um, I use social media a lot to get word out, um, interviews, um, small local articles. And I not only provide my services in Colorado, um, but also worldwide. Last year, I offered my first couples retreat in Costa Rica. So that was really exciting. And I really feel right now um, educating and I'll say normalizing Tantra um, is is my focus in getting work. Wonderful. It's it's a really great interview to have this week, and this week is when the winter solstice takes place. So it's an Earth event that is celebrated in different ways by different religions, different groups, spiritual practices. Um, the UK is very famous for Stonehenge, where people gather for this, you know, spectacle. Uh, of the shortest day. And it's just so wonderful to have interviewed you this week in time for the winter solstice to allow people to remember where they've come from and perhaps they can reconnect with them and reconnect with the earth in a better way. They can research you and see what you do, whether they can connect to that. So how could people get in touch with you, Tara, if they'd like to? Where can they find you? I can be found on Facebook at Naked Earth Tantra. But one of the challenges um, that I have with Facebook is my name. So Naked is without an E. It's N-A-K-D, Earth Tantra. Facebook will not allow me to use the word naked. Uh, of Spell course, out. <laughs> of course, <Earth> yeah. <laughs> and I'm on their uh, yellow list, so um, I have to really be careful <laughs> what I post these days. Um, What's the yellow list? <laughs> the yellow list, yes. The the yellow list is um, sometimes things in the past have been removed um, because of the word choices that I have used right. or maybe picture that may... Um, be of a naked person, but n- nothing really shown, but it's kind of in that gray area. Yes. Um, I don't know if people have reported it or their own system picks it up. Um, and then if I want to promote certain events, um, I've been denied in the past as well. Um, and I've been contacted by Facebook about my content. So wow. um, I just have to be really careful. It's um, so interesting because there's a, there's a big furore going on in the media at the moment about Facebook's inability, sorry, Facebook, if you're listening, uh, (laughs) inability to remove stuff. And that is really, really offensive and really aggressive. And, you know, adverts from certain countries, we won't mention any names. So fascinating to hear when, you know, you are 
helping people to connect to the earth and be connect closer with themselves and you're being treated in the same way that perhaps a terrorist is being treated. <laughs> so uh, fascinating, fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, it is. And it's, it's interesting because um, naked and afraid, the word naked is in there, but I believe it's because naked and I also use the word Tantra in my name, those two combined. Um, and again, that's the uh, normalizing or fear or uneducated piece yeah. of using those words together. Um, so that is a challenge that I face. So yeah, so Facebook yeah. at Naked Earth Tantra without an E and naked, N-A-K-D. Um, I can also be found on Twitter at T Scubella and Instagram at T Scubella. And my Instagram and Twitter account are kind of a mod podge of naked or tantra um, survival and my own personal life. Fabulous. That... And my website. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. And, and my website is just simply nakedearthtantra.com. Brilliant. I'll include all of these in the show notes. And, you know, I have a sense that we haven't covered even half of it, but it's just a flavor for people. It's a taster for them, you know, wherever they are in their lives or in their work, just get out into the, into nature, connect with the earth, connect with yourself and see if that makes a difference. Particularly, you know, December, the month of December is such a highly stressful month for so many people, for so many different reasons, whether it's gift giving, gift buying, organizing families to get together. And even I just took my, my stepson to his workplace, which is on a retail park with lots of stores. And it was the middle of the day and the traffic was just so blocked up. <laughs> Everybody was hooting, you know, their horns and just going totally crazy. And I was just observing it and going, oh, my God, what is going on <laughs> on this earth? <laughs> you know, it's people are spending billions and billions of dollars, pounds, whatever, on stuff that they don't even need. And um, it's fascinating to be able to observe it and, and see, you know, the rat race that everybody's in. So if anything, hopefully people have learned something. So, so I'm going to ask you one, one last question and I'll let you go. And thank you so much for your time. If there was just one bit of advice that you would give somebody who's looking to go into business, what, what could that advice be, Tara? Trust your instinct. You know what's right for you. Beautiful. Love it. It's, it's so interesting. <laughs> it's so interesting you say that because here in the UK we have a – I'll just share this really tiny story and it won't mean anything to USA listeners. Well, it will mean something because there's a show in the US that started in the US by a very famous president called The Apprentice. And we have the same show in the UK, but not by the same person, obviously a UK person. And he had some advisors sitting at the table and he was trying to make up his mind who was going to win it. This happened last night in the UK. And in the end, he couldn't decide. He decided on both people. One of the advisors, before he decided, the guy, and this is a very corporate organization with, you know, everything that you could possibly imagine in terms of corporateness. And the guy said, trust your gut, it never lies. And I went, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so trusting your instinct, I think, yeah, you are 100% correct. Even the big corporates are saying it here in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, true. <laughs> right there. 
thank you so much for joining me and wish you massive success with your ongoing journey and getting more people to discover Tantra and truly understand and not misunderstand what it's all about. And, and I, I just want to congratulate you for your survival journey in the Panamanian jungle. That's just absolutely incredible. And in fact, there's a, there's a program in, in the UK as well. There's an outdoor guy called Bear Grylls here in the UK, and he has a program called The Island. And um, so I can, I, we never, I never saw your program because it's on Discovery and you, you know, unless you have the right package, you don't get Discovery. <laughs> and uh, so I don't have Discovery, but we have a similar show that where people have to live in the jungle with no water, no food, they do wear clothes. Um, and we've seen some of the terrible things they have to go through. So I can only imagine what you went through and just a big kind of virtual high five, double high five to say, well done you. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. And we'll speak with you soon. And thank you so much for joining. All the best, Tara. Bye-bye. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 